Saturn Island illustrates a connection between the past and present that I find very interesting, and which has taken hold of a lot of corporate science and is pretty much relevant no matter where you look. Here are some sentences that should set the tone that I don't need to elaborate on because you're probably clever enough. I remember a little paper from the 1990s about the scent of bread being baked in supermarkets, making sales shoot up. And here is another sentence. 50% of anthropology students work for corporations now, same with most food scientists. And another sentence. Evolutionary psychology is used heavily in consumer studies. So, I can leave the thermostat alone now, I think we know which room we're in. I think the point, in part, of Saturn Island is to evoke images of faraway tribal cultures, and the culture that the reader is probably well enmeshed within, using the same words to describe both. Oddly enough, this small book seems more for the present reader than for those of the future. McCarthy uses images of rituals, artifacts, sacred texts, sexual taboos, religion, all in the context of a corporation based in present-day London, as well as around the world following the narrator's trips to places that might as well be London, like Frankfurt and Turin, New York. The narrator, you, is a corporate anthropologist involved with the mysterious Kube Sassen project, which is a silent presence throughout the book, but which threads it together. He also has a private obsession with trying to thread together his culture in the Great Report, capital G and capital R, Great Report, but he fails and the book becomes the failed Great Report, which is more like a comment on procrastination at the foot of his gigantic culture, which stands to represent the fact that whatever this civilization means, it will be written in other words than those we read, and perhaps even silently, and in commentaries about Saturn Island. McCarthy talks about how novelists aren't really recording, you know, the everyday world anymore. It's CCTV cameras and, you know, Google. Always Google. Kub Sassen, book backwards, the Sassen is stolen from a friend's name, according to McCarthy, is a very familiar and quite godly presence. But rather than asking for submission in religious conversion, this holy network asks for submission in consumption. Only then may you enter paradise. This is explained quite well when you writes about a small branch of the company he works for which pays people to produce video diaries, quote, confiding to the camera the desires, emotions, aspirations, and so forth that visit them as they unload a dishwasher, lace up trainers, or sip foam through that little slit you get in plastic coffee cup lids. This is with the intention of producing blueprints that gain complexity and finally produce a sort of cohesive science to these meaningless behaviours. The writer says himself, Quote, it's not that much different from what soothsayers, ichthyomancers, did in ancient times. Those wolfskin-clad men who moved from Stone Age settlement to Stone Age settlement, cutting fish open to tease wisdom from their entrails. End quote. This blueprint is for capitalism, of course. A general piecemeal movement of resources from the many to the few bodies that are wired into this system of resource transfer, in a way that excludes you unless you wish to make an exchange essentially making you live on the other side of the great paywall of China. Made in China. <laughs> That's quite funny. The general body of capitalism, contrary to a quite religious idea of it being a malicious entity hidden somewhere below in the ninth layer, is actually formed of wave after wave of men in suits and tires who are only following orders. And there's a German equivalent saying which goes like, I just work here. I just work here. But this book is not a regular critique of capitalism. It seems more like an investigation that concludes that critiquing this system is, by this point, as naive as throwing cream pies at the Vietnam War. That's a Kurt Vonnegut reference. He compares Slaughterhouse Five to, you know, because it was an anti-Vietnam War book, he compares it to throwing cream pies at the Vietnam War. It's just as effective or something like that. McCarthy plays with the idea that evil is a concentrated energy, with Yu's love interest, who explains her trip to a G8 summit in Turin, with a group of other young revolutionaries to throw a few cream pies at the holy grid of Kube Sassen, and destroy the whole superstructure, which failed. 
She then mocks Yu for his fantastic idea of bringing the system down from the inside with some kind of subversive uppercase R report. Yu goes on an anthropology museum trip in Frankfurt, and the whole scene is laden with material artifacts and a blurring of the tribe and his own culture. An old transponder is described as a totem pole, the sarcophagus is used to describe a nuclear power plant, etc. When Yu arrives, he is told that the museum houses thousands of objects from Oceania, Africa, and the Americas. He chooses to go to the room which contains Oceania. These scenes, taken from the ninth chapter of Saturn Island, are so brilliant that I've transferred them directly into this dialogue. It begins with Claudia, a material anthropologist, explaining the abundance of strange artifacts contained in the museum to you. Quote, The Sepik is a river in New Guinea. The museum, she said, sent an expedition up it to acquire material culture. They stopped off at every village on the river's banks, one after the next, and the natives sold them things. Word spread, she said, from settlement to settlement. As they arrived at each, the tribe would be waiting there with all their tribal objects laid out like a jumble sail. The expedition brought so many objects that they filled whole boats and trains with them, stacked up in giant containers. The idea was that you needed to study the morphology of, say, a cooking pot how the shape and decoration varies from one village or one family to the next. That's why you needed twenty, fifty, a hundred. And, of course, she added, you could trade surplus objects with other anthropology museums back in Europe later. We'll swap you ten headrests for two totems. The prevailing wisdom was that you had to gather everything. A hammer or a pair of scissors might tell you as much about a culture as a sacred fetish suddenly release its inner secrets like some codex. But then, she said, all that changed. How? I asked. Well, she said, from the mid-sixties there was a turn away from objects. Suddenly, the prevailing wisdom was that you didn't need to look at pots and arrows anymore. You need to study patterns of behaviour and belief and so forth. Your school of anthropology, you. She cast an angry glance at me. Trapped with her in this bunker, this cage, to which she alone held the keys, I didn't argue back. She took my silence as an admission of guilt and sighed. Plus, she carried on in a more conciliatory tone. We Europeans started to suspect that it had been a bit shitty to take all these objects in the first place. So now, she said, sweeping her white glove, already a little smudged around the room, we've got these storerooms full of crap we'll never show, or even understand. What do you think, for example, she asked, opening another cabinet and pulling out a strange wicker contraption. This thing is for... A snowshoe, I suggested. You, she said, it's from the tropics. And then a fishing net, I tried again. Maybe, she said. A fishing net, ceremonial headgear, a bat for playing some kind of game, a cooking implement, who knows? We don't. We won't. We haven't even catalogued half this stuff. What should we do with it? Why not return it? I asked. That doesn't work, she answered curtly. The tribe's descendants don't know what this wicker thing is for either. They've all got mobile phones and drink coke. End quote. And then it picks up later on when he's on his way back home from Frankfurt. Quote. On the flight back from London. To London. Sorry. As the stewardess gave me a cup, or I removed a teaspoon from its packet, or folded down and up the tray table and the seat back just in front of me, the term material culture played and replayed itself in my mental airspace, like a snatch of a stuck record. I couldn't help but see these things, this table, teaspoon, cup, as tribal objects, also adjustable air conditioning nozzles, slide down blinds, velcro fitted headrest covers, motion sickness bags, buttons with human icons on them and the like. Aliens, after all trace of us has disappeared, bar the small handful of our corpses they'll preserve for intermittent laying out on their tissue-coated slabs, will have whole bunkers full of these things, stuffed into naphthalene-laced cabinets, twenty of each spilling out of every drawer, and wonder what the fuck they were all for." End quote. Now who is this writing for? McCarthy is not calling anybody to react against what he's reporting and is actually making a very uninteresting argument about how pointless reaction is when the entity that you're supposed to be reacting against is networked. 
He's also saying nothing you didn't already know, if you've spent your life interacting with what this book reports on. Perhaps this book is for the aliens, then, or maybe for the historians. A reviewer on Amazon claimed that Saturn Island is a book of ideas, which calls readers to discuss the things it contains. I took what I took from it, and this is what I said. I don't know if this is what McCarthy wanted to hear, but the only other responses I can see are those girls who hold books up to cameras like that's how you enter a book, then confiding to the camera the desires, emotions, aspirations, and so forth that visit them as they unload a novel. Interestingly, I was on a cruise ship last summer by Italy, and I'd failed to bring a copy of this book with me, and I'd also forgotten to take a coffee shop with me, but there was a cost on board, and in the library there was a copy of Saturn Island, despite being in the ocean. So it's sort of an element of what it's reporting on, <laughs> like an artifact that describes itself. And the next part of this video is a rejected review I sent in to um, the book bag about Remainder, another novel by McCarthy. And I'm not salty that it was rejected, but I'm going to read it anyway, because there's no other outlet. Remainder is a novel which describes a mind that was capitalistically destroyed. What I mean is, it received brain damage at work, so it was given eight and a half million pounds. The story, which is crookedly etched into form by this mind, which remains unnamed, simply concerns its repeated attempts to reenact memories and events, which it either recalls or was late to. The part of this mind that we see rove the city of London, and the memories and missed events it builds, even the loyally consumed coffee the man is assigned to enjoys, are all the remainders. What is missing from this mind and the reality it inhabits is never described, although the fun had by McCarthy in strictly never pointing this out, and the fun the reader can have if they understand this is boundless. Tom McCarthy is a word processor who was born into London, or one of its moons, and I've found out since he grew up in Greenwich, and has been well described as a diver in an ocean where most writers are treading water. Remainder is an artifact which he found on an expedition deep into the waters of this particular cultural experiment, amidst other murky, unwritten objects he might have instead presented. It's fine that this novel is a fairly light article, considering how much one can be sure is down there, and what the writer's heaviest influences, Kafka, Joyce, Beckett, have found and displayed. But the edge McCarthy has on these names is that he's not dead at the moment. The type of person who half reads a book and then reviews it sourly on Amazon. Quote, I managed to get about halfway, stopped reading halfway, has called remainder nausea-causing and mindless, which is clearly true. McCarthy has been described as one of those creeps who will show up on lists like the Man Booker Prize that simply shouldn't be there, throwing off the whole literary scene or simply misleading it, and even he has agreed with that statement. He is a very subversive and unsettling mind, because his content is one with the reality it describes, much like Kafka. He has actually been called a Kafka for the Google age. I'm convinced the fear of his work is synonymous with fear of this reality. Substance and events, I hear, are what the contemporary audience enjoys, but I would not have enjoyed to hear about the shape and form of the thing that hit this book's narrator on the head, and then I would not have enjoyed to know what he was wearing, and watch the necessary civilizational procedures all take place to bring him back to workable health, drawing the novel to a close. I can only thank Zeus that the novel actually begins where such a terrible book would have ended, and the event that provokes this story is nestled into such words as bits, and then swept aside. This means that the book is like one big plot hole, a painting of negative space. This plot hole was also a bestseller, despite having rowed through unnecessarily small crevices and estuaries, and being conservatively inked into saleable products, before finding the popular bookshelf with vintage. It's a particular reader who enjoys McCarthy, a three-star hovering maniac. The point about McCarthy's diving trips into the contemporary world's- I can see why this review was rejected, it's not actually about remainder at all. The point about McCarthy's diving trips into the contemporary world's depths is more relevant as we come to the character of Naz Rule. Naz is there to assist the narrator with his reenactments and never ask why, much like an obsequious SS officer. Working as Time Control UK, the name of his company, 
Nas is the power of money over nature and civilization, although I think the difference there is by degree only, if there is a difference. Our hero needs a replica of a bank he would like to play Rob, which Nas creates. Our hero needs the police files for a recent shooting of a drug dealer, so Nas bribes them into his hands. The one thing Nas cannot be relied on to bring our hero is authenticity, and the moral of this story is not that you can't buy happiness, it's that you can't buy authenticity. Authenticity is, by the way, a reality of fridge doors that open perfectly, and cigarettes that light in one go, a smooth world. He references Robert De Niro films and, you know, things like that, where everything is just so suave and cool. And he wishes he could live in such a world, and that's sort of what drives his reenactments. Back to the text. The fact that money is politics and vice versa is common knowledge. It's older than one of the Roman Republic's insurgents, Crassus, who claimed you aren't really rich unless you can afford your own army. The narrator can afford his own army, but he does not arm them and take over the Senate. He simply makes them reenact whatever washes up on his broken mind's shores. The duo of Nas and the cracked mind that orders him is the most interesting thing McCarthy dug up in his foray into brain damage and capitalism. The fact is, such people as the narrator really do exist. Also, they're the ones designing our increasingly synthetic cities. They're the ones landing coffee shops and shopping centres and shopping centres and fields like spaceships, asking you to engage in absurd behaviours like abstaining from other coffee spaceships by wearing their loyalty card like a wedding ring. Although in acts of passive insurrection, most people either accumulate these loyalty cards like a polyandrous wench and buy what they want, or they just buy what they want. Our narrator does not see anything wrong with actually remaining loyal to one coffee shop, however. The attention paid to such subtle insanity and the clarity and smoothness of our world to the people who have it is an underlying silver lining to a book that is not immediately useful. Essentially, the narration of the book is just as broken and useless as the narrator. This was intended because McCarthy is the type of insightful person who can see that words are thoughts given form. And because the narrator is crazy, what do you think a narrator who is reliably proving himself to be crazy in action with the requisite money to keep defending that claim is going to use words to do? Our hero is the best chance we have at seeing what crazy is and does. Like Forrest Gump. Stupid is as stupid does. And it is not to be found where Stephen King and even David Lynch are pointed. Crazy people are a very subtle breed. They're often very rich and intelligent. They can be good looking and blissfully unaware of their mold, and consider that much of this story a warning. Another reviewer of Remainder, <laughs> like I am one of them, another, named Patrick Ness, my contemporary, did strike the book with a small complaint. The final scene, which I wouldn't dare describe in a review, was to him fairly clunky and almost a composite Palaniuk passage. I agree. Attention to the otherwise omitted facts of the narrator's experiences are brought into the fray. The point was that it was supposed to be a very intense scene, but you don't do that by just, I don't know, bringing nothing to the reader's attention but more words. Ness was otherwise very happy that Remainder existed. He also claimed that other such pleasingly off-kilter books could be laying fallow at this moment, unknown and unpublished, and this worried him. This is certainly true, and it worries me. What there is to be done with this knowledge is this. Just be thankful that this mutant spandrel of literature ever saw the sun. And that's the end of the review. Now, about that last point, I have since found another writer who I think is up there with Tom McCarthy in the contemporary world anyway, Ben Marcus. And it's interesting in the inlay to um, The Flame Alphabet, his most recent book. Quote, the Flame Alphabet drags the contemporary novel kicking, screaming, and foaming at the mouth back towards the track it should be following. End quote. And then Tom McCarthy.